My top five defensive assignments. And in thinking about this, I took out Larry Bird because everybody knows Larry, is, that's, that's the number one, the hands down. So I took Larry out and I said, okay, what other five players gave me the most problems? CLNS History is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Playing against some of the best in the game, I'm just saying these are people that, that really kind of made it difficult for me. Let's start up. Andrew Tony. People forget about this young man. He came in in 1983 and helped the Philadelphia 76ers uh, 444, which I hate to this day. A lot of kids don't remember this young man because this guy was very good. 6'4", strong. If you want to fight, I'll put the ball down. We can fight. He's one of them kind of guys. Andrew Tony was uh, hard to score, could post up, could take you from about 18 or 20 with uh, one of those players that's able to get to his spot. And as a defensive player, you always want, you don't want that offensive player to get to their spot, wherever it is on the floor. And Andrew Tony could do that. He could do it with a little bit of physicality. Uh, he could do it with some smarts. He could do it just by jumping over you. Very athletic young man, strong, strong. Andrew Tony's my number one. Again, I hate to say that these guys are number one, but he's one of five. So if he gave us 40, I might have caught maybe 18, maybe 20 of those. But I don't, any team, any, if I ever started in a game, well, nobody going to get lit up on me. No, it wasn't going to fire going to start me. He might score, but he wasn't going to be scoring. By the time I got in the game, Andrew Tony, they was giving to him every time down. Doc would throw it to him and stand to the side. Moses would get out of the way. Usually Moses come and post up. No, they gave him Tony, but Andrew Tony was a good one. My second person who I love to this day, man, is George Iceman Gervin. And you know what made him so crappy was Gervin, here I was, 6'7", I weighed probably about 175 pounds when I played. Gervin was 6'7", six, 6'8", six, six, 174 pounds, built identically to me. Oh, and that's God. what made it hard to guard him because when I was able to slither around the people setting picks and move, Gervin was able to get between both of us, you know, not myself and that. Uh, George has scored. The one thing I, I loved about his game is that you try to get people, angles are very important in the NBA. When I'm trying to guard somebody, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get the best angle so I can block your shot, but the angle to move you away so you couldn't uh, use the backboard or put you in a difficult position to where you couldn't see the basket. Gervin loved that. I've never seen anybody that can shoot the ball off the backboard at different angles than anybody in this game. George Gervin was the best. Uh, a guy that just 
slithered and just his game was so relaxing him if you could say that he played and he just kind of like ice man that's a great great name for him because he had ice in his veins he didn't give he didn't give a fuck what point in time in the game what the score was i'm gonna score because that's what i do best george gervin uh had a real weird sense of humor you know and one day you know he he would score on you and he'd laugh when you're going down the court and he said uh, he would tell me hey Coop, that's a good try man you almost got that <laughs> and then laugh at you about it okay yeah. hey you know what don't worry about it. you get the next one and he's gonna score again so gervin had a great sense of humor love playing against him probably one of the most competitive guys uh he was on that on that team when they they got artist gilmore Mm -hmm. San Antonio finally got Artis Gilmore, and they told us, uh, oh, we're going to ride the A train. We're going to ride the A train all the way to the championship. Well, the A train got derailed when it was coming out west and through the west. And But you know what? George Gervin never got derailed. He always he, he did his part. The next one's Dr. J. And I don't pick the doc because he dunked on me. <laughs> I always say the dunk. You know, people ask me, why, why didn't you get out of the way? Well, one, I was trying to get out of the way. But two, in the back of my mind, uh, being a defensive player, you always want to have that special moment. And when Dr. J came in and I saw that whole play developing, You know what? And I say this today, if I could have got up, if I could have, would have, should have. I know all of that. But for some reason, if I could have got up in the air because he came at me like this, if I could have got up and got turned, Nick would have been the greatest block of all time. And that's only in my little legendary mind. So, but we we know what happened. You know, Doc done it and just rocked the cradle and all of that. And the one thing I always tell people about that is that uh, they can't show that. They can't show that other than the NBA, but you know, Doc, I did a, a drink for, um, I think it was Hennessy, and uh, they wanted to use that clip. And uh, they had to call me, and they had to say, hey, Coop, you know what, we're getting ready to, you know, it's a piece for that, we're gonna show a part of this clip. Is it okay to use it? I says, well, no, I gotta get paid, I gotta get something. And they sent me out a nice little paycheck. Uh, it was just a one-time thing. But, you know, at that time, I'm thinking, oh, okay, it's a lot of money. But little did I know they were going to show it 50,000 times. So mm -hmm. I only got paid for the one time. But, you know, Dr. J was a great player. As he, as he lost a little bit of his athleticism, as he got older as a player, Doc started moving in, posting up a little bit more, became a master of that little 12, 13 foot bank shot off the left side. He still had that soaring gracefulness about going to the basket. And, um, you know, you again, when he got up on the basket, it was going to be a dunk. But Doc became a complete player. And I'm not saying that he ever was, but as you lose, uh, as you see LeBron, as you see Magic, as you see Kobe, when they lose that athleticism, they start getting smarter and move closer to the basket and start redefi redefining their game a little bit. And Doc was one of the best at doing that. And again, uh, a player that I have ultimate respect for and a player that was very, very hard to stop for me was Vinny Johnson. Uh -huh. You thought I was going to say Isaiah Dumar. Yeah. Vinny yeah. Johnson, the microwave. Man, Vinny Johnson to heat up. It's like you go to your microwave now and you got something you throw out and go, okay, what is it? 30 seconds, 25 seconds, 10, whatever it was. You, Vinny Johnson come in the game and was heating up, man. And a little stocky guard, about 6'3". They say 6'4". I ain't buying that. <laughs> six, uh, just strong as shit, man. Vinny was, a, I, I, I call him, we used to call him little fire hydrant because he was hard to move. And you know, if you moved him, that's like you hit a fire hydrant, what's going to come out of there? A ton of water. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vinny was like, that if you moved him and got him going, he's gonna be a ton of points. And had a weird shot, weird but shot. they didn't get it off on anybody. And just when Vinny posted up and got his feet down, you couldn't move the guy. I don't think he gets enough recognition 
for that team. You know, the team obviously was built with Isaiah at the point, but you know, you have Dumars and Robin and Beer and Mahorn, the the and uh I don't. I don't want to call them the bruise brothers. That's giving them too much respect. I'm gonna call them the dirty brothers. My <laughs> orange and half them. They weren't no nasty, <laughs> hit, nasty. They're just fucking assholes, both of them, and tough <laughs> players. But uh, you had a respect for them because they held their own down there. But Benny Johnson was the key to that team because if Isaiah or Dumars wasn't on, and even if they were on. Coach Daly would put him in the game, and then you had three problems out there. And Benny being the worst one because Benny could score. It didn't matter who was on him. Somebody was bigger, he was able to go around him. If you're the same size, he's going to score over you. If you're little than him, you would do shit. And Benny Johnson was a good one. So Benny clocks in. Player that, uh, again, resembled me a lot and uh, played in one of the most horrific places that you could play. The Denver Nuggets was, comes in Alex English. Like and Alex, 6'7", about, Alex probably weighed maybe five pounds, maybe seven pounds bigger than me, about 180. Alex English played in Denver. And that was an ideal place for him because the guy never got tired. You pair him with uh, Fat Lever, uh, Kiki Vandaway, Calvin Nat. Uh, uh, Danny Shades. I mean, they had a great team, and they had Doug Moe, a coach that really knew how to utilize that that climate, that atmosphere, that city. Because with the high altitude, they, I, mean, <laughs> I used to love playing against Denver. You ask why? Because I knew I was going to play a lot that game. That was tough for Kareem. Uh, that was tough for Michael Thompson. That was tough for James Worthy. Them guys, Magic, to run up and down. I, man, I loved that game because I always played. I knew I was going to play at least 30 minutes up there. Uh, that they, When they got up and down the floor, Alex was running the floor. And you had to have people to run with them. So uh, Alex English had that weird high, high shot that way over his head. Uh, wasn't very physical, but could score at any angle on the court. He seemed, he, he reminded me a little bit about George Gervin, but a little bit uh, more physical. I mean, and I said when Alex was physical, he banged on you. I, you didn't feel it, but he was banging on you. But all he wanted to do was create distance from you. And Alex could score. You couldn't foul him because he was about a 90, 95% free throw shooter. Uh, ran the floor, made the game just look easy. He just he just ran and and we get there. And next thing you know, the guy was scoring. And a uh, very tough player to block because he was so long, long arms. Uh, but Alex Ingles has scored with the best of them, man. And again, he's another player that don't get enough recognition. Because when you look at the NBA, you're looking at LeBron, you're looking at Kobe, you're looking at Shaq. Well, about these other guys that might not have been that big persona, big version of, of those players, he still put up the same kind of numbers. And Alex English got my ultimate, ultimate respect. My honorable, honorable mentions, Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dubars, Dale Ellis, Dominique Wilkins. There were so many players back there, and that's a small honorable mention because there were so many. Michael I would Jordan. say Ains, but I saw Ains too much. He went to BYU, and I went to New Mexico, so we were playing against each other back then. Dennis Johnson, I saw him every day here in L.A. when we played in the summertime, and then when he was at Phoenix, played against him there. Uh, I never guarded Chambers, but Chambers had probably one of the most awesome dunks ever where he jumped over that guy and he put his feet <laughs> on his shoulder. That was a great dunk, man. I, I, I think that that dunk is better than the Dr. J dunk on me. That this guy jumped over. I had never seen anybody that high. Right. I'm talking about guys that uh, people have a tendency to forget. You don't forget Jordan and Bird. But these guys that I just named, their names don't aren't household names. Yes, they are Hall of Famers. Uh, yes, they are top of the game. I really do believe Andrew Tony, had he had not gotten hurt, would be a Hall of Famer. But uh, I just wanted to come at it with a different angle on it. Because... Denard King? Who? Bernard King. Bernard King, I caught him at the end of his career, and he really didn't impress me as well as David Thompson. David Thompson, people forget about him. David Thompson was a hell of a player, but again, I caught these guys at the end of their career, along with um, um, Lou Hudson. Mm -hmm. Lou Hudson, a great scorer, caught him at the end of the career. Uh, Ron Boone, mm -hmm. people forget about him. I saw him in Utah. Ron gave me the most nastiest welcome in the NBA. I remember when I came with the Lakers, Ron Boone was with the Lakers. And because we were in that youth movement, all those players, Ron Boone, Lou Hudson, 
uh, Jim Brewer, uh, all them guys got shipped out because myself, Magic, came in. Well, Ron ended up in Utah. And the first time we played Utah Jazz at the old Salt Palace, that old round building and stuff like that. He had just gotten traded there. It was a it was a first regular season game. And we come, I get in the game, Ron Boone's in there, and Ron is probably about a year away from being retired from his career. So he knew, and he had some venom for me. So I'm running down the floor, and I'm just a new guy. I got the ball through the magic. I'm running down the floor, and I, I was calling the play, and I cut down the middle. Ron Boone hit me so hard in the chest with his forearm, and he hit me hard. And he said, welcome to the NBA, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that, that right there changed my whole life in the NBA. I said, that's the last time somebody would ever do that. I'll never forget that. I, I passed the ball and I'm making a cut through the lane and Ron was guarding me and hit me. Oh, I mean, took all the air out of me and I just grabbed myself and ran to the side, glad to catch my win. But as I was going, he said, "Welcome to the NBA, motherfucker." That's my top five. What a show! What a show! I'm uh, uh, amazed that people are listening. I've had a couple of my friends call me and say, "Hey, Coop, we watch the show." <laughs> and you're funny, and I don't mean to be funny. I'm just telling the. Show. Telling the truth from the Michael Cooper angle. With that, another episode in the can. Want to thank all the listeners out there for listening to Showtime with Coop. Come on back because we got some more. Yeah, we done roasted JJ a little bit, but you know what? There's going to be many more. And uh, again, JJ, I love you. I don't dislike you, but I can't let you guys just shit on us, man, because we were some tough basketball players there. Can't compare us to these guys nowadays because basketball players are different. The game hasn't changed. The players have changed. And we were some hell of a players back then. So that's it. Love y'all. The Showtime Podcast with Michael Cooper is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Massachusetts, listen up. The wait is finally over. FanDuel, America's number one sports book, is now live in Boston. I have so many people that love me in Boston, and new customers in Massachusetts can get in on the action with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash Boston. Finally, you can bet on all your favorite sports from the money line to point spreads to player props and more. Don't miss your chance to get $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. Visit fanduel.com slash Boston.